Hey guys, what I'm going to talk about now is uh, paid versus earned versus owned media out there. Um, so let's go to a blog post I did uh, several months ago on this particular topic and let's discuss this. So I am going to go into screen share here and let's go into that particular blog entry, which was on August 3rd, 2013. So understanding paid, earned, and owned media. Okay, so, so let's go through this and then we'll, we'll talk about a few things here. So there are three ways in which you guys can get exposure out there in the digital space and it falls in those three categories. So let's go over what each of these are. So when we're talking about owned media, we're talking about basically your, your main presence out there, your website, your blog, your Facebook page, your YouTube channel. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking own media. Okay, so it's kind of like your, your storefront in a way. Okay, when we talk about paid media, again, these are ads that you're buying, like banner ads, paid search ads, video ads on YouTube, maybe even sponsorships. Okay, so that is what we talk about when we say paid media out there in the uh, digital world. Now when we talk about earned, so this is earned media. These are kind of earned impressions that you get. So we're talking word of mouth, good reviews on Yelp, comments people put, put on blogs. Uh, somebody is sharing your story on Facebook or, or sharing something you posted out there or other user generated content out there in the social channels. So those all fall into earn. You're not paying for it, you're kind of earning it uh, because of all the good stuff that you're doing. Okay, so I've got a little graphic here of, of how it is paid, earned, and own, and all play important roles in your marketing effort. Okay, they each bring something to the party. So again, you're not going to just be relying on one or the other or two. Again, they all work together synergistically. So let's just kind of think about it in a way. Own media, again, remember what we said own media was. It's kind of like your website, your Facebook page, or your blog. It's what you own. You control the content on it. Okay. Own media provides information really to your current prospects and people that already know about you. They might be in that particular conversion funnel. And again, um, I have another video out there again on the new conversion funnel. So again, if you forgot about that, make sure you go back and take a look at that video on what the conversion funnel looks like. Okay. Um, so again, own media is really working on those people that are already there, already aware of you somewhere in that particular funnel. Okay, it, It's the media that helps keep them engaged. Paid media, you can think of that as a way you're doing that in order to kind of capture and inform non-customers or people that really aren't aware of your brand. You're kind of putting messages out there uh, for them to say, hey, I'm here, hey, what about me, think about me. So it could be an organic search, it could be banner ads, um, things along those lines, okay, to get in front of the person, okay. Um, paid, again, serves as a way of getting prospects into that funnel. And then earn media, again, think of that as, as kind of the fuel that ignites the flame. Okay, and helps the, the word spread a little more quickly. Okay, uh, it helps to build your advocates uh, to help extend your reach and your brand, your goodwill, all of those sort of things. Okay, although we call it our media, typically money is being put behind those efforts. Right? Again, you're out there on Facebook, you're paying somebody to manage content, to get the engagement, to find the people that are going to be the advocates for you. So again, it's not that it's free necessarily. You do have some people behind the curtain kind of um, working working the magic there to, to ignite those flames. Okay, All three are important from an advertising point of view um, and should be a part of the mix. Uh, you know, uh, and, and again, you know, but of the three, our media is becoming obviously increasingly more and more important. You want to create those advocates. That's the best way to get new customers and to work them down a funnel it is the advocacy. Okay. Uh, where earned for a large part is a result of your paid or your owned media efforts. Okay. So again, don't forget all three work closely together. As, as the saying goes, one plus one equals three is definitely the case here. Here are some interesting facts that I just wanted to share with you from various studies. 
and I'll show you where you can pick up some of these studies in a different blog post that I did that I'm not going to go over here. But just so you know, there's been several studies, and I'm citing the sources here from either Nielsen, Syncapse, Comscore, etc. Ad recall of a social ad is known to be 55% greater than of a non-social ad. Okay, remember this is just all on average. Offline sales of people exposed to a brand's website is three times more likely to make a purchase than those that were subject to a paid ad alone. So again, the offline sales of people exposed to a brand's website is three times more likely to make a purchase than those that were just exposed to a, a, a paid ad alone. Uh, so that's pretty uh, significant. 90% of people trust the recommendations of people they know. 70% of people trust recommendations of people that they don't even know, like Yelp. So we're going to talk about this in a second. And um, again, there, there's been Yelp's been in the news recently again, as usual, with respect to having a corrupted um, reviews. And so I want to make sure you guys know what Yelp does to filter out bad reviews. They work very hard at it. And you know, I think they do a pretty good job. Obviously, a bad apple or two is going to sneak through now and then. And I'll, I'll take you to a, another website here, and we'll we'll look at Yelp in a little more detail. Fans and friends of fans for Starbucks. So this was a Starbucks study done by Comscore. Fans and friends of fans for Starbucks were found to spend eight percent more and transact eleven percent more in the store than non-fans and non-friends of fans. So again, just showing you the value of engaging them and getting them to be a part of your Facebook presence. Um, fans are forty-one percent more likely to recommend a brand to a friend uh, than a non-fan. Again, that was from another study that was done. So as we can we can clearly see it's it's not any one media alone but all three that basically create your presence. Now let me just show you quickly with respect to most of these stats here. If you go to another blog post I did last year on uh, September 14th of 2012, it's measuring social ROI. Now again, I'm not going to worry about the social media calculator for this purpose. That that may be a future uh, video I do. Um, but what I do get into again are a lot of the different studies that have been done, like the power of like by Comscore. Square. Now this was a 2011 study. They did update it again in 2012. So this is where the stuff from Starbucks came from. Lots of interesting things. You know, again, talking about the value of a fan. You know, again, fans 41% more likely to recommend a brand to a friend. So here's where you can get a lot more information, guys, on that. And at the bottom, I have a lot more resources here to help you get some of those if you still want to dig in a little bit deeper. Okay. Now let's just talk about Yelp for a second, and I want to make sure you guys. Um, are comfortable with Yelp and know how Yelp deals with uh, false reviews. Again, they take it very seriously, as you can imagine. So here's a recent article that we saw on Yelp on fake reviews. Don't worry, we've got this. So let's just read a little bit of this, and then we're going to watch a video of yours. So um, let's just see. Oh, wait a minute. I need to go back one more time. Sorry. Um, where is their video? Do I not have the right one pulled up here? Um, oh yeah, okay, here it is. I'm sorry. Okay, so again, let's take a look at what we've got here. This was just posted in September of 2013. So last week a study from Harvard came out looking at Yelp review fraud suggesting that about a fifth of the restaurant's reviews are fake. Do you trust reviews you read on Yelp? Let us know your comments. It received quite a lot of attention, even making it pretty high on the front page of Reddit, where thousands have commented. Among those commenting are some of those who claim to have worked at Yelp in the uh, past. Uh, following is what Reddit uh, user E. Henning had said about the controversial review filter. Um, let's move on here again. You guys can read that as well. Um, you know, but at the end of that, uh, they're saying now I'm not claiming that 100% of re Yelp reviews on Yelp are legit, but I'm sure as I'm not going to say that 20% are not fake. The study is flawed in so in so many ways because they didn't have the proper data set to really understand what goes into review filter, which happens to be Yelp's greatest proprietary asset. Um, Yelp has since taken to its blog to address the study, uh, saying that its findings should become a complete surprise as consumers increasingly turn to online reviews to find a local business. The incentive to our 
additionally improve one's reputation also increases, the company said. But neither should the fact that Yelp has been on guard against these very same reviews from the earliest days. Once again, Yelp pointed to its review filter, sharing the following video again from March 2010. So, you know, keep in mind, reviews are Yelp's livelihood. You know, they're working as hard as they can to weed out fraudulent reviews. But is is that study said 70% of people tr go to Yelp and trust reviews of strangers. So if that's the case, you know, people are going to be more apt to try to fraud the system to get a good review for their company when maybe it doesn't really warrant it. Um, so let's just take a let's take a, a, a watch of this video. It's about three minutes and it goes through and talks about their filtering process and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more. Sick and needed to find a doctor. The gentleman was in the city and there were lots of doctors. And since he didn't have any local friends to ask, he didn't know where to find the best doctor for him. Well, Jeremy thought to himself, there were plenty of people out there. What if there was a way that the people could share and find information about doctors that they could trust so they could make a decision? If the concept of sharing opinions and insights about doctors worked, why not carry that idea over to other local businesses? Restaurants, mechanics, boutiques, you name it. So he started Yelp.com, a place people could go when they needed to make a well informed decision. You see, while there was plenty of information out there, it wasn't necessarily information you could always trust. Way back when the web came around in the 90s, a bunch of sites popped up that tried to offer local reviews, but with no real means to guarantee that those opinions were completely legit. And unfortunately, a few businesses devoted time to writing reviews that made their business look great, and sometimes even making their competitors look, well, not so great. You know what they say about a few bad apples. So consumers were left pondering whom to trust, and Yelp realized they had to do things a little different. Jeremy and the rest of the Yelp team devoted countless hours talking to businesses and consumers about how to solve this problem. And the result was revolutionary in its simplicity. People needed a filter, so to speak, so they would know who to trust for a recommendation. I mean, think about it. Filtering is a natural process that we already do. There's certain people, like friends and family, whose opinions we value more than other people because we don't have to question their motive. Because if we just listen to what everyone had to say about everything, we could never make a good decision, especially if there's bad apples out there. So we needed a way to be able to tell the difference. The thing was, no one had ever attempted to create a filter that was fair and effective for anyone and everyone. So this is what Jeremy and his team at Yelp set out to do. But to understand how Yelp uses the filter to give consumers the most trusted reviews, we first need to explain how Yelp works. Anyone who wants to write a review on Yelp has to have an account. This is an easy step, but it helps us know that reviews are coming from a real person, not just a hired robot. When people have an account, they can start to develop a personal profile. This profile will display all of the reviews that the user writes about restaurants, services, or places that they have experienced. It can even contain personal information so that people can get to know a little bit more about that Yelp. But whether or not people are writing reviews, everyone uses Yelp because they want to find a great local business. Imagine you're looking for that perfect burger joint or a hardware store that's within walking distance. Each and every local business and service on Yelp has their own business profile. There, you can not only find the address and hours of operation, but check out photos people have posted and see what special offers a business might have going on. And most importantly, you have access to the wide and diverse ratings and reviews shared by their Yelpers. And this is where the filter comes in. All reviews that live on people's profile page go through a remarkable filtering process. It takes the reviews that are the most trustworthy and from the most established sources and displays them on the business page. This keeps less trustworthy reviews out so that when it comes time to make a decision, you can make that using information and insights that are actually helpful. And this process happens each and every day. Giving people what they want is a complicated process. If you use Yelp a lot, you have to know that not every real honest-to-goodness review makes it onto a business page. That said, Yelp is always making changes and tweaks to make the filter more accurate and powerful. If you picture this on a business page, that means that the reviews are always changing. As new reviews are written and other Yelpers are becoming more trusted, you may see their reviews pop up. At other times, a review you saw yesterday might not show up today. Either way, rest assured that our engineers are working to make sure that whatever is up there is the most unbiased and accurate information you will be able to find about local businesses. Yelp is always working to do as good a job as possible on a very complicated task, only showing the most trustworthy and useful content out there. Because if you're a small business owner, you know that nothing is better than great work now. And you're probably wondering if Jeremy ever found that doctor. He sure did. And that's what Yelp does every day, connecting people with great local businesses. Yelp.com. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of information about their review filtering process. And again, obviously, it's in their best interest to do as good a job as possible. You know, that they want people to come back and continue to use the reviews and to be trusted. They're not going to be able to catch all the uh, fraudulent, fake um, reviews out there, obviously, but they're doing the best they can. Now, there was another little scandal that Yelp had also which again, I don't believe there's any solid data against it, and uh, somebody had kind of proved that there really was no correlation. But Yelp has also been accused of extortion by small businesses who claim that Yelp, you know, kind of 
sets aside the positive reviews um, through their filtering if they don't agree to buy ads from the up sales team. Um, again, um, uh, I believe Harvard had looked at that and saw no real correlation with respect to that. And again, I don't really think Yelp would be doing something like that. It just would not be in their best interest. You know, however, their filtering process is working and reviews come in and out all the time and they're putting in you know, more trustworthy reviews. Again, things are going to change and maybe for some companies it might be that the most trusted at that particular point in time today versus yesterday happen to be a little more negative than positive. Um, again, so, you know, they're kind of looking at their Yelpers and seeing, you know, how much can I rely on a Yelper uh, and, and I'll use their reviews more so than somebody else's. So again, you got, you got to think about what their business model is. And again, if they're not giving good customer satisfaction, it, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day if, if we don't trust exactly um, what they're doing. Now, again, they also have been very aggressively going after companies that engage in what they call astroturfing. Okay, and that's companies that go out there and put false um, um, recommendations out there. So as far as fake reviews go, Yelp is not taking them lightly. The company has been actively engaged in lawsuits again, so is creating them. Last week, New York Attorney General announced that 19 companies agreed to stop writing fake Yelp reviews and paid over $350,000 in fines. Consumers rely on reviews from their peers to make daily purchase decisions, as we know 71% do, or anything from food and clothing to recreation sightseeing. This investigation into large-scale intentional deceit across the internet tells us that we should approach online reviews with caution. The companies that continue to engage in these practices should take note. AstroTurfing is the 21st century's version of false advertising, and prosecutors have many tools at their disposal to put an end to it. So again, they're all working hard to try to deal with the, the scams that are going on out there. So again, take a read of this article uh, in a little more detail uh, if you like. And uh, again, that goes to the heart of earned media again, which is so, so critical in moving the consumer down the funnel. And again, if you did forget kind of the issues of that purchase funnel, take a look at that other video I did and blog posts uh, on that. Actually, I think it's a blog post right after this where we talk about the purchase funnel. So look for that video in my um, on my uh, video channel uh, for digital strategies at the University of Missouri St. Louis. Okay, and um, I think that does it for this particular topic. Let me just close out the screen share. And uh, hopefully uh, that helped you guys understand a little bit uh, those three types of media and media buys. And um, again, you guys can always follow me on Twitter at PD Drake. Um, and uh, see you out there on Twitter.